Welcome to our presentation on the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. Yes. And courts. If... <laughs> <laughs> the bill is a huge piece of legislation which introduces changes across the criminal justice system. It covers changes to investigation and court processes, sentencing, police powers, and the introduction of new and amended criminal offences. These changes affect both adults and youths. As the name suggests, it's very broad in scope. The government termed it as a justice overhaul when the bill was introduced into parliament. It may help to think of it as a vessel for the government to introduce as many criminal justice related changes as they could in one go. With parliamentary time being limited, there aren't many opportunities to do so. It was introduced to Parliament on the 9th of March this year and has been making its way through both houses since then. It successfully passed through the House of Commons. Dozens of amendments have been proposed at that stage, but the government did not approve any of them. The Commons did not approve any of them. However, there will still be some amendments to be expected to the bill. A new pet abduction offence still to be drafted will, to be, will be introduced in the House of Lords where the bill currently is. While the theft of pets is already an offence, the government wants to avoid pets being seen in law as property. They are therefore creating this new offence, which will be separate from the Theft Act. It remains to be seen how exactly it will work, as further details, including sentencing, are still to be determined. The bill is expected to receive royal assent by the end of the year. Some parts of the bill will come into force at this point, other parts will come into force two months later. The bill itself is over 300 pages long with 12 main parts to it. Some parts are bigger than others and some have multiple chapters within them. We'll be taking you through the bill in turn with each of us covering separate parts. It's impossible to mention absolutely everything. There are 177 provisions, but we've tried to cover as much as possible within the time. I'll start with part one of the bill, which deals with the protection of the police. A new police covenant will come into force, which is a formal promise that members or former members of the police force should not be disadvantaged as a result of working in policing. The promise itself will not be enshrined in law, but the legal duty for the government to prepare an annual report on the police covenant is enshrined in the bill. The covenant broadly mirrors the existing armed forces covenant, the same national promise ensuring service men and women in the armed forces are treated fairly. The bill doubles the maximum penalty for assault against an emergency worker from 12 months to two years in prison. The government wants to further recognize in the law, the seriousness of assaulting members of the emergency services. However, the consequence is that it elevates the offence even further above other common assaults, which could arguably be considered just as serious, if not more serious, given their context. For example, a domestic violence common assault would carry the six month maximum. Identical assault would have a two year maximum by virtue of the fact that it was committed against an emergency worker. It's also unclear whether the change will have any impact. Recent statistics show that only 6% of those sentenced for assault against an emergency worker received an immediate custodial sentence of six more months or more in length. The government's response is that until recently there were no specific sentencing guidelines for assault against an emergency worker. With new guidelines having been recently introduced, the government says it now expects sentencing to increase. The bill introduces a new legal test for the standard of driving of a police officer when deciding if it meets the threshold of dangerous driving or careless driving. Currently, a police officer's driving is judged against what would be expected of a competent and careful driver. The newer test applies where a police officer is driving for police purposes and has undertaken the prescribed training. Their driving would be considered careless if it falls below what would be expected of a competent and careful constable who has undertaken the same prescribed training. It would be considered dangerous if it falls far below what would be expected of a competent and careful constable who has undertaken the same prescribed training. 
And it would be obvious to such a competent and careful constable that driving in that way would be dangerous. The change is designed to protect police officers by recognizing that their skill and training could permit them to drive in a way which may be perceived as careless or dangerous if a member of the public did it. But it's somewhat of a double-edged sword as it could also mean that where police officers deviate from their own policy, even if that is above the standard of a competent member of the public, their driving could be seen as de deemed as careless or dangerous when it wouldn't be at the moment. I'll now hand over to Adam, who will move on to part two of the bill. Part two of the bill is separated into four separate chapters, and it deals with the pre prevention, investigation and prosecution of crime. Following the serious violence strategy in 2018, steps were taken to implement a multi-agency and public health um, approach to preventing and tackling serious violence. Chapter one, therefore, places a duty on specified authorities to collaborate with one another to prevent and reduce serious violent offences. This means that there will be greater emphasis on intergovernmental departments and local authorities to share intelligence to help prevent serious violence. Whilst the attempts to tackle serious crime must be commended, it remains to be seen how each department may interpret one another's intelligence, which remains just that. Caution must be applied to ensure that overzealous prosecutions are not based on speculative intelligence from third parties. And there is also, of course, some difficulties between different public agencies, and data sharing must be transparent and collaborative to ensure that these goals are met. Chapter two places a duty on relevant authorities to undertake reviews into homicides where offensive weapons are used. Currently, where a person under 18 dies to domestic violence, a vulnerable adult dies, or someone in receipt of mental health care commits homicide, the law requires a formal review to take place between local safeguarding partners and to, in order to improve future responses. But the bill proposes to extend this further in order to help tackle knife and gun crime, as well as homicide. Currently, most adult homicides are not subject to a formal review, and therefore there is no proper process in place to learn lessons and to make recommendations for changing and improving investigative techniques to prevent homicides. Chapter two, therefore, introduces the new requirement for adult homicides involving offensive weapons. This will now involve the local authority, the police chief constable, clinical commissioning groups, and local health boards. Again, here the action must be commended, but will require sufficient resources, for which we hope will be provided in order to achieve the goals. For example, of the 732 offences initially reported as homicides in 2019, 510 of those did not meet the criteria for an existing review. Yet, nearly half of those, 251, will now meet the new test for involving an offensive weapons. Chapter 3 then establishes a statutory framework for the extraction of information from digital devices for the purposes of preventing, detecting, investigating or prosecuting crime. In today's world, many pieces of important information and evidence is now held on digital devices, including those from complainants and witnesses. Accessing such information is therefore critical to confidence in the criminal justice system and in order to ensure a fair trial. Information on these devices and the ability to extract them is therefore crucial to most criminal investigations. Chapter three of the bill therefore introduces a specific legal basis for the extraction of information from complainants and witnesses' digital devices. This will be a non-coercive power based on the agreement of the routine user of the device. Whilst one would hope that this creates a more consistent and national approach to digital review, there is an argument to suggest that this may be to the detriment of the defence, where a defendant may be precluded from obtaining key evidence concerning their defence, where the power for data extraction remains non-coercive. Whilst there must be a careful balancing exercise, it will be interesting to note whether any further amendments to the bill help to tip, help to tip the balance in favour of the defence particularly given the recent cases of the likes of Allen and others. Chapter four then deals with a number of issues. First, in relation to the pre-charge bail system, 
The bill removes the presumption against pre-charge bail in order to reduce those released under investigation, ensuring that bail conditions are more effective. The government now plans to adopt a neutral position in the legislation, encouraging police forces to impose pre-charge bail only when necessary and proportionate to do so, i.e. we are going back to the position that we were back in 2017. One would therefore hope that this reduces the time spent between arrest and trial, given judicial authority will be required to extend pre-charge bail beyond nine months. However, again, proper resourcing will be required to ensure this is so. Because without this, it is difficult to see how the system in 2017, which was coined as unjust by Theresa May, is any different to today. Meaning that many individuals may be still put on onerous bail conditions without being charged for a number of months until they are then invariably released under investigation once more, should judicial authority not be met. Secondly, it, uh, <clears throat> this chapter then deals with the commission of child sex offences. The bill addresses a gap in the law um, identified in section 14 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. That section contains a number of specific child sex offences providing that it is an offence to undertake acts in preparation to one of those offences contained within section 9 to 13 of the Act. However, it currently does not apply to offences um, concerning sections 5 to 8 of the Act, which concern rape and other offences against children. <coughs> that is now addressed by the new <coughs> bill. The chapter also extends the definition of a position of trust to include those that lead activities in sporting and religious settings. Thirdly, chapter four strengthens the court's power in relation to criminal damage to memorials. Many here would have seen the press report surrounding this bill, indicating greater sentencing power of up to 10 years in prison for criminal damage to memorials. The act itself, however, removes consideration of monetary value with respect to criminal damage to memorials which would otherwise, in certain cases, determine venue and, and limit sentencing powers. Therefore, whilst the bill provided controversial headlines as to sentencing powers, in reality, all this really does is bring memorials in line with other forms of property, given that at the time of sentence, other forms of damage can include things such as emotional impact or, or, or sentiment, which may now be considered as an aggravating factor in criminal damage to memorial cases. Thus, although the damage to memorials may now be subject to greater sentencing powers of the Crown Court, this does not mean that the maximum sentence will always be imposed. Rather, a judge will be entitled to analyse the ordinary sentencing factors. Fourthly, Chapter 4 makes amendments to the Crime Overseas Production Orders Act 2019. This allows law enforcement and prosecutors to seek associated communications data attached to contents of the communications from service providers located and located or operating outside the UK. For example, who the email was sent to or what the email contains. These orders will require international cooperation. The first of these agreements expected to enter into force is the UK and US data access agreement. A dual application alongside mutual legal assistance request is still required, though the amendment is hopeful to streamline the process as a whole. Fifthly, Chapter 4 creates a provision for the taking of photographs and non-intimate samples post-conviction, where this was not done upon arrest. And finally, Chapter 4 creates new powers upon the police to obtain information about the location of human remains <coughs> where there is no ongoing criminal investigation. This part of the chapter was mainly inserted due to the case of Keith Bennett, who was a victim of the Moores murderers Ian Brady and Mara Hindley. Here, a warrant to search two suitcases belonging to Ian Brady, believed to contain information relevant to the remains of Keith Bennett, was refused on the basis that it was no longer possible to bring about any prosecution as required by Section 8 of case against Ian Brady and Myra Hindley following their own deaths. The change therefore now addresses that gap in the law. Moving then on to part three, which deals with public order. Part three, strengthens the police powers to tackle non-violent protests. The bill identified that current legislation to manage protests were predominantly aimed at countering behaviour 
For example, the Public Order Act 1986 <coughs> helps prevent serious disorder and damage to property or serious disruption to the life of the community. However, legislation governing the management of protests was much more limited. Restricting the police to specify the protest maximum duration is the number in attendance and the location. But recent changes by uh, tactics used by protesters, for example, those gluing themselves to buildings, blocking emergency services, or halting public transport networks, suggested that gaps may exist within the current legislation. The bill therefore attempts to widen the range of conditions that the police can impose upon assemblies by placing any necessary condition on a public assembly, as they can do with a public procession. The bill also lowers the fault element for offences relating to the breaching of those conditions and increases the maximum sentence for organisers who fail to comply with the conditions to six months imprisonment and or a level four fine. The bill also widens the range of circumstances in which the police can impose such conditions, for example, on the use of noise, where police reasonably believe that noise generated may have a significant and detrimental impact <coughs> on persons in the vicinity, or it could cause serious disruption to those running an organisation. The bill provides the power for the Secretary of State to make a provision about the meaning of serious disruption to the life of a community or an organisation. The bill then replaces the common law offence of public nuisance by a new statutory offence covering any conduct which endangers the life, health, property, or comfort a section of the public or obstructs them in their rights. And finally, it creates a new stop, search and seizure powers in order to prevent serious disruption by protests. This part of the bill will no doubt create controversy. The powers dramatically restrict citizens' rights in, in their freedom of assembly and expression, for example, by allowing the police to intervene by virtue of protest noise, and by allowing the Secretary of State to determine what constitutes serious disruption, meaning that the threshold and the definition may remain vague or ambiguous. The provisions there, therefore may allow the government an expansive power to declare the protests are, that are inconvenient or uncomfortable, unlawful, and provide the police the power to license them. But on the contrary, as I'm sure some of you will be aware, there's been plenty of examples where the right to protest has simply gone too far, and it has gone beyond that which is enshrined within our democratic rights. For instance, there have been many examples of protesters delving into acts of criminal damage to further their cause, going beyond any Article 10 rights. Can I have an example? On the screen are two recent new leading cases indicating the balancing act between the rights of protesters evidenced by the case of Ziegler, and the right of the state to protect property as indicated in Ditchford. Whilst we do not have time to delve much further into these today, these are interesting cases to read if you wish to further yourself on this topic. And I'll now pass on to Doug, who will deal with part four of the bill concerning unauthorised encampments. Now the government is very clear that this section of the bill is to crack down on gypsy, Romany and traveller encampments. Currently, the police have two principal powers to move on the groups of travellers under the Public Order Act 1994. And this is if an officer reasonably believes that two or more people are trespassing with a common purpose of residing and the occupier has taken reasonable steps to ask them to leave and members of the encampment have caused damage to land or property or have behaved in a threatening, abusive um, or insulting way towards the person who owns the land or there are six or more vehicles on the land, then an officer can direct them to leave. There's a second power where if an officer reasonably believes that one or more people are trespassing and there is at least one vehicle on the land and they have a common purpose of residing there and there are also caravans on the land and there is an alternative site within the borough, officers can direct them to leave. Now, if a person fails to leave, as soon as reasonably practicable, or returns after leaving within three months, they've committed an offence. The maximum penalty for that offence is three months in custody or a level four fine or both. 
The bill proposes introducing a new offence of residing inland without consent in a vehicle. So if a person fails to leave without reasonable excuse or leaves and then returns within 12 months of vacating when asked by the occupier, an associated person or a police officer, and that person resides on the land and has caused significant damage or disruption to the land, or if that person even intends to reside on the land and it is likely that they will cause significant damage or significant disruption, that would be an offence under the new bill. And the maximum penalty is the same as before, three months in custody, level four fine or both. It also amends the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act by increasing the period that persons can be directed away from the land from three months to 12 months and allows the police also to direct people away from the highway, not just private and public land. And this allows for the creation of guidance in relation to the new offence. And the creation of guidance is something that the House of Lords Joint Committee on Human Rights touches on. Now, the House of Lords Joint Committee on Human Rights says that without amendment, this section of the Act is likely to breach Article 8, Article 4, and Article 10 in relation to travellers. They found the wording of the legislation too broad in terms of what a person intends to do, damage that is likely caused, and they put a particular issue with the word insulting. A particular reference is made with the way in which travellers or people in a travelling community, community may react colloquially to somebody who uh, is asking them to move on and how offended somebody who's asking them to move on may well be. They highlight that these three words together, being intends, likely or insulting, allow prejudice to permeate the offence, whether that is through conscious or unconscious bias towards these communities. They suggest, in fact, that guidance should be published in advance of the bill coming into force, so police and those engaging regularly with traveller communities can better engage with them and manage any likely offence which will arise. The traveller-led charity, Friends, Families and Travellers, they say that this pushes travellers into the criminal justice system simply for existing nomadically. They highlight that there is a direct correlation between accommodation and security and health outcomes, stating that traveller life expectancy is between 10 and 25 years shorter than the general population because of the cycle of being moved on, criminalised and cut off from services. So this section of the bill is likely to directly affect the life expectancy of travellers. Liberty, rather unsurprisingly, suggests that this section of the bill should be removed entirely and highlight that travellers are one of the most marginalised and disadvantaged communities within the UK. I'm now going to hand over to Lucy. Part five of the bill covers road traffic. The bill makes a number of changes to driving offences. It would increase the maximum penalty for causing death by dangerous driving from 14 years imprisonment to life imprisonment. Similarly, the maximum penalty for causing death by careless driving when under the influence of drinks or drugs would also be increased from 14 years in prison to life in prison. It's not clear that this will actually make any difference. For both offences, sentences are not near the current maximum. Between 2015 and 2019, fewer than 5% of offenders received a sentence of more than nine years and four months in length for both offences, and their average sentence was 11 years. There will also be a new offence of causing serious injury by careless driving with a maximum sentence of two years in prison. There will be a new offence of failing to surrender a driving license where the person is disqualified, which will be summary only and punishable by a fine. I will now hand over to Adam, who will cover part six of the bill. Part six of the bill concerns cautions. It creates new at two new tiers of cautions, replacing the current existing six disposals, as recommended by the Lamy Review and the Chance to Change programme. This programme is a pre-court diversion programme designed for adults to focus on rehabilitation over deterrence. Police forces currently have access to up to six out-of-court disposals, as indicated on the slides. But there will, now, there will now only be a lower tier disposal, which is known as a community caution, and an upper tier disposal, which is known as a discretionary 
Now, a community caution is essentially the same caution we all know now. It can include conditions, for example, compensation. But a diversionary caution is much more focused on rehabilitation and ensuring that reoffending is minimised. Here, any condition can be imposed to help rehabilitate the offender so long, as it, so long as it is proportionate and appropriate, thus allowing for much more creativity in, in sentencing. The bill also plans to pilot a problem-solving court approach, where certain community and suspended sentence orders will allow a judge to lead a multidisciplinary rehabilitation team to enable them to initiate breach proceedings at regular review here. They can expand drug testing and expand drug rehabilitation requirements. There is also a power to order a short custodial penalty where offenders breach an order. Here, one would hope that a tailored and more creative approach to sentencing and the use of cautions may allow for a may allow for proper intervention and support for vulnerable offenders at an earlier stage and allow the focus to be on rehabilitation rather than deterrence. For example, in Manchester, which is running one of the pilot problem solving court, approach, uh, <coughs> court approaches for women, that area has a lower annual average reoffending rate for female offenders compared to similar urban areas in England, that being 15% compared to 23% in the period of April 2017 to March 2018. One would therefore hope that this more sensitive approach to sentencing will help to rehabilitate reduce reoffending as a whole. Now, I'll now pass on to, deal, to, to Doug, who will deal with part seven. Part seven deals with the sentencing and release of offenders and is divided into two chapters, the first being custodial sentences and the second being community sentences. The custodial sentences, which the bill addresses, are whole life orders, the statutory minimum for repeat offenders and the increase of the requisite period of custody for certain violent sexual offenders and offenders of particular concern, and also seeks to increase the time offender serving in a sentence in prison for offenders of particular concern. So whole life orders are currently appropriate in several circumstances relevant to this section of the bill. One being the murder of a child involving the abduction of a child for sexual and sadistic motivation and the murder being committed for the purpose of advancing a political, religious, racial or ideological cause. Whole life orders at present are currently only available for the offender if they're over 21 years old. The proposed change is to make whole life orders appropriate and available where there is a premeditated murder of a child and to make it possible for someone aged 18 to 21 to be able to be subject to whole life order in exceptional circumstances. Now, this change is proposed following the conviction of the 22nd of May Manchester Arena bomber's brother, where the judge said he was unable to pass a whole life sentence uh, because of the offender's age. But in this case, it would have been just to do so. The changes to the statutory minimum for repeat offenders are fairly minor. Several offences, as you know, have statutory minimums, which the court can depart from if they wish. The proposed change is to have the court depart from these minimums only in exceptional circumstances. And the intention of this is to make the increase the deterrent effect of these mandatory sentences. The increase of the requisite period of custody for certain violent sexual offenders and offenders of particular concern is by abolishing the automatic halfway release for serious offenders. Currently, serious violent or sexual offenders who receive a standard determinate sentence of seven years or more and the maximum penalty for the offence is life are required to serve two thirds of their sentence instead of half. The change is to apply the two third release point to offences with a standard determinant sentence of over four years where the maximum penalty is like. The government states that the offences that this is primarily intended to cover are rape, manslaughter, soliciting and attempted murder and section 18 wounding with intent. The government again states that the intention of this is to increase the deterrent effect of sentence 
and better reflect the gravity of the offences committed and ensure the public is better protected. The bill also seeks to increase the time offenders serving a sentence for offenders of particular concern spend in prison. If a person receives a sentence for offenders of particular concern, the bill intends to ensure that they are only released at the two third point rather than halfway through their custodial term of sentence. This sentence must be imposed where there has been a conviction for a specified offence, but the offending itself is not serious enough to attract a life sentence and where the court assesses that the offender is not dangerous and so does not require an extended determinate sentence. The sentence for offenders of particular concern uh, apply to specific terrorist offences and rape of a child under 13 and sexual assault of a child under 13. The bill further introduces a new power to prevent the automatic early release of prisoners who become a public protection concern. And this allows where cases are referred to the parole board for the parole board to assess whether it is necessary to detain a prisoner for the protection of the public. So if the prisoner is not released by the parole board, they will be released at the end of their sentence. And this power is intended to be used in rare cases where there is strong evidence which shows that the public are at risk of serious harm or there may be a national security threat. The referral itself will be made by the Secretary of State for Justice. Chapter two deals oh, with. Just before you move on to that, sorry to interrupt. Can we just check whether we have got people in the waiting room? I'm not sure if I can actually. Can I? Not... I think you might be able to if you drag the cursor over to the right. Yeah. I, I can. I can see if on the screen in the bottom right that there are people in the room. Right. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> no, I think that's that's Sorry to no, no. No, 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 no. Chapter two deals with community sentences um, and it tends to increase the flexibility of an electronic monitoring for community sentences, increasing the maximum curfew to 20 hours per day, increasing the maximum length of the curfew, which means it can be increased to two years, bringing it in line with the maximum period that exclusion zones can be imposed for. It also grants the power for probation services to change the curfew start and end times without adjusting the total hours imposed to allow people to return to work more easily and engage with their family more easily. They also, the bill also creates an unpaid work statutory duty which requires the probation service to consult local and regional stakeholders to ensure that the community orders and their requirements benefit the local community which they are to be served in. I'm now going to hand over to Lucy. Part eight of the bill covers youth justice. Looking first at community sentencing amendments, the bill makes a number of changes to the youth rehabilitation order. The daily maximum curfew hours will increase from 16 to 20, mirroring the changes to that of a community order, while retaining the weekly maximum of 112 hours. A standalone electronic location monitoring requirement will be added to the list of available requirements for a youth rehabilitation order, known as a whereabouts requirement. <coughs> At the moment, an electronic monitoring requirement is a way of monitoring a young person's compliance with other requirements. The government says the rationale behind it is to help provide an additional protective factor for the child and improve confidence in tougher community sentences. But it's not clear what the specific point of the requirement is if it's not linked to anything else. The upper age of the education requirement will be increased so that children who are past compulsory school age but are still in compulsory education will be eligible. There will also be changes to the youth rehabilitation order with intensive supervision and surveillance. This order must contain an extended activity requirement. The maximum length of this requirement will be doubled from six to 12 months. There will also be a mandatory whereabouts monitoring requirement. The reparation order, where a court could require a young offender to make reparations to the victim or the community, will be abolished. The idea behind that is that there will still be avenues for reparation through referral orders or the youth rehabilitation order, but the reparation order itself was hardly used. <laughs> 
Moving on to youth remand, the bill amends LASPO to try and ensure that a custodial remand is a last resort for youth. Under the change, before deciding whether to remand a young person to youth detention accommodation, the court will first have to consider the interests and the welfare of the child, and it must state in open court that this is being considered. The bill also strengthens the other provisions that have to be met before the court remands a young person to youth detention accommodation. The bill makes a number of changes to youth custodial sentences. The bill ensures that the detention and training order can be of any length between four and 24 months. At present, a DTO can only be of specific fixed lengths. The bill also makes changes to the way remand counts as time served on a DTO. Currently, time spent on remand or bail on a curfew is taken into account when determining the appropriate length of a DTO. The approach is to double the time served on remand or bail with a curfew and then subtract that from the overall DTO term proposed to arrive at the final sentence. Under the change, the time served on remand or bail with a curfew will be taken from the time just spent in custody as it currently is with all other custodial sentences. This will result in longer overall DTO sentences for some. There will also be longer DTOs for some due to the impact on early plea discounts. At present, if an early guilty plea discount leads to a DTO length between fixed points, the lower sentence length is given, which may result in a reduction of greater than a third. The abolishment of fixed length sentences means that early plea discounts will never be more than a third reduction. So while the changes will advantage, disadvantage some young people, it does closer align detention and training orders with other custodial sentences. The bill abolishes automatic halfway release for young people under the age of 18 who are sentenced to detention of over seven years for certain specified offences, violent and sexual, that carry life sentences. They will instead serve two thirds of their sentence in custody. These are the same offences to which adults who receive between four and seven years custodial sentence will now have to serve two thirds of their sentence in custody. Mirroring the change for adults, the minimum tariff of a life sentence will now, in statute, be based on two thirds of the equivalent determinate sentence instead of a half. The bill amends the tariff starting points for murder committed by children under the age of 18. Currently, the starting point for detention at Her Majesty's Pleasure sentences is a fixed 12 years in all cases. Starting points will now depend on the age of the child and the seriousness of the offence. The bill also amends a number of minimum term reviews that those sentenced to detention at Her Majesty's pleasure are eligible to apply for. Currently, they can apply for a minimum term review at the halfway point of their sentence, and they can then continue to apply for reviews every two years. Under the change, those aged under 18 at the time of sentencing will still be able to apply for the halfway point review, but they will only be able to apply for a further review two years later if they are still under the age of 18, which in reality would very rarely be the case. Anyone who is already aged 18 or older at the time of sentencing will no longer be able to apply for any review. Part nine of the bill covers secure 16 to 19 academies, what the government has termed secure schools. Secure schools are a planned new form of custody. The government's idea is that independent providers will run the secure schools and place education, health and purposeful activity at the heart of them. The government has said that secure schools will be run by not-for-profit providers. The first secure school is due to open on the site of the former Medway Secure Training Centre next year. The provider of that school will be Oasis Charitable Trust. But to enable this, the government has to amend legislation to ensure that operating a secure school can be a charitable activity. This is, of course, controversial since punishment is not a charitable purpose under the Charities Act. In the long term, the government's vision is that secure schools and similar smaller units will replace young offenders institutions and secure training centres. I will now hand over to Doug 
to cover part 10 of the bill. Part 10 covers the management of offenders. The bill creates the serious violence reduction order and the courts will be able to make this order in respect of offenders convicted of any offence involving a knife or an offensive <laughs> weapon. The order gives the police unlimited stop and search powers over anybody who is subject to that order. And the court is to decide when the order is necessary, subject to each case's merit. The person subject to the order must be over 18. However, the government notes that age will be kept under review. And this indicates that the government is considering extending this order to youths. There's a minimum duration of this order to last for six months, and the maximum duration is two years, with the courts to decide on length. The bill also provides for rights of appeal, provisions on for variation, discharge, and renewal. A breach of the order will be a criminal offence, and the maximum sentence for breach will be two years in custody and a limited fine or both. Now, the order is to be tested by a small number of police forces before it is rolled out nationally. And this appears to create an individualized, suspicionless stop and search power within the boroughs in which the police will be testing the new power. This will enable the police to search any individuals who are subject to an order. And the way in which that this has been viewed is that boroughs which are subject to over policing are likely to then have any victims, anybody who is subject to this order, feel compounded discrimination. Um, within that community. The management of sex offenders, uh, the sexual harm production, prevention orders and sexual risk orders will be reformed. And it will be explicit in statute that the court may impose a tag um, with these orders to monitor offenders. And it allows courts to pass a prohibition on foreign travel as part of these orders. And this is with a view to protecting people in other countries to people, from people who are subject to these orders. They will also be able to impose positive requirements like drug or alcohol treatment programs as part of these orders and will ensure that Scottish orders are enforceable in England and Wales and English and Welsh orders are enforceable in Scotland. There will also be a change to the prescribed police stations. Registered sex offenders currently must notify their personal details at specific police stations and these are currently prescribed by regulations. The bill will remove this and enable chief constables to directly set out the police stations at which sex offenders must notify their details. The management of terrorist offenders. This new section gives the police three new powers. The first is a premises search. On application of a warrant to search an individual's home, if they are a terrorist risk <coughs> and unlicensed, the police will then be able to enter a person's home and search it. And this is to ensure that they are complying with a license. There will be a power of personal search to enable the police to search suspected terrorist offenders as a term of their license when required. And this will be limited to offenders who pose a high risk of serious harm and only applied when necessary and proportionate to do so. The final power is that of urgent arrest to enable the police to arrest a terrorist offender who is likely to be recalled to custody due to a breach of license without a warrant and will only apply in certain circumstances where there is a recall required. And this, recall, this urgent arrest power should only be made once probation has stated that they are going to recall the prisoner. Now this new power is brought in with a view to preventing incidents like at Fishmongers Hall, which resulted in the death of Saskia Jones and Jack Merritt. And it's suggested that Usman Khan might not have been able to carry out this attack if the police had these powers. I'm going to hand over to her. Part 11 of the bill concerns the rehabilitation of offenders. Here, this part contains provisions enabling some custodial sentences of over four years to become spent after a period of time, as well as reducing the time that sentences under four years have to be revealed to employers. A key element in reducing reoffending is access to employment. The clause, this clause therefore amends the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974, allowing for some custodial sentences of over four years to become spent after a certain period of time, meaning that when asked, the conviction would not have to be disclosed to the employer. This reduces the number of ex-offenders required to disclose their convictions as part of the basic employment checks, 
ensuring that they are not unfairly discriminated in the job market. The change, however, does not apply to any sentence of more than four years following, following a conviction for any serious violent, sexual or terrorist offence. The policy therefore means that such convictions will continue to never become spent and will always need to be disclosed. It would therefore appear that a, a fair balance has been struck in implementing this part of the bill, the bill and it is perhaps commendable, <coughs> it is perhaps a commendable approach uh, to allow offenders to rehabilitate through employment, particularly where statistics show that up to 50% of employers would not consider hiring an ex-offender. The move appears to provide more of a focus on rehabilitation through access to employment, but also allowing a fair balance to public protection by excluding serious, violent, sexual or terrorist offences from never becoming spent. And I'll then pass on to Doug, who will deal with the final part of the bill. Part 12 brings new procedures in relation to courts and tribunals. The introduction of uh, British Sign Language interpreters for deaf jurors means that they will be able to have an interpreter in the jury room, which they are unable to do at the moment. This will enable profoundly deaf jurors to partake in jury service. British Sign Language interpreters will be contractually bound to a confidentiality agreement, which will stipulate their obligation to always remain impartial, and they will also be asked to swear an oath to that effect. This legislation will not be open to other types of, of translators. There's also going to be changes to remote hearings, and this is done initially through a repeal of sections 53 <clears throat> to 55 of the Coronavirus Act. And this is the section of the Coronavirus Act which temporarily extended the Criminal Justice Act, the Crime and Disorder Act, and the Courts Act. The bill will introduce new provisions which make the temporary expansions permanent. And this should make the technology which has worked well, or some may say not so well in the pandemic, more readily available and more flexibly available. There will also be criminal procedure rules, practice directions and guidance from the Lord Chief to ensure a consistent approach is taken when considering applications under the new scheme. Controversially, the government in its explanatory notes to the bill provides the example of remote juries sitting together collectively to participate via live link. The section of the bill also enables the court to direct proceedings to be transmitted electronically for the purposes of enabling those not present to watch or listen to proceedings. The bill also introduces video remand hearings in police stations. So rather than a first appearance at the magistrate's court, this will enable the defendant to remain at the police station. There will be a video doc officer and a custody video single point of contact who will oversee and coordinate the video hearing and any meetings the defendant has with their lawyers or with probation. Now, during the pandemic, the custody officers were able to do the second of these two roles, but were not able to be video doc officers. The bill allows the custody doc officer to act as a video doc officer by granting them custody over detainees for the purposes of video remand hearings. The government also notes the section of the bill is intended to simplify the provisions of the Coronavirus Act, widen access to justice, and prevent some of the recent modernization within the criminal justice system. Uh, Adam, Lucy, and myself would like to thank all of you, whether you're attending in person or virtually. And we hope you've seen the bill as just an expansion of police and sentencing powers, and also proposes some useful legislation for practitioners. And as you will be aware, the press has seized upon the opposition through public protests and opposition in Parliament, and it is likely to be continually opposed as it progresses through the final stages before becoming an act and even after enactment. One complaint which has largely been absent of protests and therefore underreported is the effect that this bill will have on the public purse. This will increase the amount of time offenders spend in prison. And the financial ramifications are likely to be huge when currently in the 2019-2020 year, the overall cost of an average prison place was £44,650. Now, we would like to invite some questions from you here, um, but if you prefer, we will happily chat about this bill over some wine. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. Yeah, I was going to say thank you all very much. It's obviously a clear to all of us that you've done a lot of work on it and you've collaborated together extremely well. But I must say, it was such a dry and rather expensive subject. <laughs> 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 It was a very clear summary, and I'm sure 